construction. After we sign off, Carolyn, yeah. uh, we'll step out of the frame and then yes. count to 20 before you turn that off so I can add an end screen. Yes, sir. For all You're you on. folks. Say hi, guys. We're on. Hi, dogs. Hello, everyone. How's everybody doing? Doing good. We're good? We're good. Doing good. We good, Carolyn? Yep. Got We're sound? Good. We got everything. All right. So, well, I, I wore my, my special 4th of July shirt for tonight. I figured got hey. a holiday coming up. Thanks for the memo. You didn't tell me nothing. <laughs> Wearing the plain old stuff. Actually, actually, I looked in the closet. It's the only thing it wasn't dirty. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what the heck, you know. What you got to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't believe I got all 27 shirts laying on the floor still. I don't know what. <laughs> it's a beat by one. Yeah. That's why I'm yeah. wearing this jacket. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I got to remember that trick. Jacket over dirty shirt. There you go. That's it, man. There you go. So we are going to talk about, uh, Kristen uh, reminded me, I think uh, she's our trivia winner. We're trying to get her her bumper sticker prize. She reminded me we were going to talk about military dogs uh, a couple of weeks ago. After she named the coyote Jeep as the answer to our trivia question. Yep. The critter was a coyote. 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 Coyote, yeah. I told y'all like four times and no one caught it. Yeah, he was talking well, about why they coyote chasing a road runner. Yeah, and whatnot. But anyway, a couple of people were listening, so that was a good deal there. So, But we'll have some more coming up here. I'm trying to find some more uh, benders on for y'all to figure out with this internet. This, pain, this dang internet thing going on now, you can't hide much from anybody. No, anymore. no, you can't. You really can't. But, so we're, we're going to find some things we can hide from you and, somehow. And everybody had good answers. It was amazing yeah. how many people answered and what they were actually, some good ones. Very Not good. very many repeats either, so that, that means there must be a lot of dogs, war dogs out there. Uh, yeah. That's what made realize also. We had a lot, over 20 answers. Yep. Some by email, some on the, on the site here. Uh, I got some in my, my shepherd sites. Uh, there's a lot of dogs out there. There's a lot and, of dogs out there. But there, I'm talking, there's a lot of war dogs out there, but a lot of decorated war dogs also. The yes. heroism and the bravery of these dogs is unparalleled. Yes. And this is, this is before they had all these trainers and everybody had dog psychology. This was back in the 40s and 30s. Yep. Hell, it was yep. something in World War One, but that's, we won't worry about those tonight, but uh, just the, what the military did to start these dogs and how the whole program started. Yeah, yeah. And we actually, the U.S. actually, Britain and Germany both had dogs in World War I. And with all the trench warfare, they used, I mean, hundreds of Airedales and other dogs. In fact, here's a trivia question. I've already got the, uh -oh. the smallest, huh? Here we go. The, the smallest war dog in war, in combat, ever. Ever? Ever. The smallest. We're also going to talk about another dog that is the only one ever. But what is the smallest war dog ever used by an official military unit? Okay. Now, <laughs> listen, listen to what I follow this with. In World War I, in the trenches, and there were no radio communications, so they used, the British especially used hundreds and hundreds of Airedales to deliver messages back and forth. Pigeons were getting taken out. They were using pigeons as well. Those weren't as, they were getting taken out too. Yeah, they were, yeah. Air yeah. targets, yep. Yeah, they would all get, you know, there were casualties on both sides. <clears throat> and when you talk about uh, military dogs, a lot of people like to, especially now since uh, we have the Russian-Ukrainian thing, not to, not to get political, but no, we're not. they talk about one of the things the Russians did in World War II was they trained dogs to take out tanks. Yeah. They just trade grenades to them and make them crawl underneath them? They, yep. Ooh, but what they did was they, they fed all the dogs underneath tanks, <laughs> right? They fed them under tanks, fed them under tanks, fed them under tanks. Then they went like two weeks without feeding them at all. This is as they were coming into, I guess, Moscow, Siege of Moscow or something like that, St. Petersburg. And they got all these really hungry dogs who were used to being fed under tanks. They strapped explosives to their harnesses and they pointed to the, uh, uh, the German tanks mm -hmm. and they turned the dogs loose. There's only one problem with the whole deal. Half the dogs 
went and found the same Russian tank that they'd been crawling yeah. under to get fed, and they blew up half the Russian tanks. Yeah, because them Panzers and them Tiger tanks were strong tanks. Yeah, Panzers. The Tigers were bad too, but they're yeah. one weakness. What? The bellies. The be yes. That's yeah. That's why the talk. Yeah. That's why they had them. Pretty obvious, underneath. but yep, yep. So, so there's been a lot of innovative things with done with dogs, but it started for Americans in World War II. And although we're, you know, big on our SWAT dogs, the, the SEAL team dogs that are going, taking out Osama bin Laden and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got some amazing dogs and amazing dog units out there today. Um, Denmark, Sweden, all the Scandinavian countries, and of course, Germany. Uh, Israel's got some of the finest mm -hmm. going. But <clears throat> it all started for our country in World War II the military had seen the success that the British had in World War I and the many uses they had for the dogs. So they put out a program and they asked for, and remember boys, we're not talking about real sophisticated dog folks. We're not talking about some farm boys who grew up with a bunch of animals. We're talking about highly educated generals and politicians. The way they went about animal stuff was not necessarily the way Scott and I would have gone about it. So mm. they just asked for volunteers. And I think something like the first, just donate your dog, donate your dog to peace. And we'll give them back at the end of the war. And there's, I think the picture I have in the thumbnail of this, you can see there's dogs this big and there's dogs this big, mm -hmm. you know. There was something in the first six months like 10,000 dogs donated. Yep. And you know? basically that being started, uh, the Americans, our country was attacking from both sides, the left coast and the east coast. So the threat of the Germans coming from Europe and the Japanese closing in made a, a big need for sentry dogs. Right. Within the first month, there was 1,800 handler teams with sentry dogs on all American coastlines. By the end of the war, there's almost 5,000 dogs patrolling the beaches Damn. for enemy sh uh, shubs and whatnot so right just to, that, that's not a lot compared to what just starting out with other dogs they built off of that so the century was the first thing they did and then they went started doing the other training yeah the, they had everything from detection mind detection dogs to you name it and mm -hmm. again the way they trained was not always um, the way we would train today in the first place they had no idea how effective a dog's nose was so when they <laughs> All you trainers, listen up here. I'm going to give you a, a military way of training a dog. When they wanted these dogs to be able to detect landmines, because on, in, on the German front, the Germans, as they were retreating, left a lot of landmines. And that was taken out, especially in Italy, was taken out a lot of our troops. So they decided that wherever they dig, to plant and bury a landmine, there'd be some exposed wires or something. So they would get the dogs to recognize torn up ground where they had dug to put the landmine down. It's chaotic. Uh -huh. if, they, if they would have known the dog could smell, yes. I would train them sucker to smell gunpowder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Yeah, anyway. You know, you a thousand GIs. I'm, I'm, I'm not putting nothing down. 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 It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. That, was a, that was actually a where it started. Yeah. People were just learning about how to do this. That's it. They had yeah. no idea what dogs could do. War does crazy things to people. War does crazy things to people. So that was the first thing they discovered they were totally wrong about. And I'm trying to think, what was the one with Star Island, Mississippi? So uh, Star Island is off the coast of Alabama. Alabama. All right. And there was a whole deal there. They wanted to go to the Guadalcanal. The war in the Pacific, the Pacific. Was, was heating up. And right. casualties were mountain. Guadalcanal lost how many hundreds of thousands of men or thousands of men, you know, you know, Iwo Jima, everything else. Iwo so Jima, they were getting right. to these, the Marine Corps was getting to these battles and in the jungles, dense, you know, not a good place to be. So they came with the idea of, hey, let's make these killer tag dogs. That's what it was, yes. Killer yes. tag dogs. You're so we're gonna, we're gonna train these dogs to go out there and sniff them out and hunt down and kill these Japanese. Hidden in these bunkers and these islands because they were all they were they were they were trenching pretty good over there. Yeah, you know, a lot of them might know this. So they had to have a plan how to train these dogs to smell the Japanese. So they had an island called Star Island. 
about 40 miles off the coast of Alabama. <coughs> so they went ahead and set this up. So they had uh, Japanese prisoners all over the country, basically ones from California. They, they, they flew them over to Alabama at <laughs> night, brought them in, and landed a plane on the tarmac, and let's kept them in the plane. This is all top secret stuff because they're making Very this whole top secret, right? This whole new attack dog, and this is going to be the the rave of the next generation. They kept them till dark and put them on boats, and sent them across to the island at night. Get them ready. They, they were padded too. They had the pads. I guess they had gear on, and they made these people go hide in these locations in the swamps everywhere. And they had these dogs, the scent dog, to go attack, and they launched these dogs out there to get these people. Yep, and after after a few hours, or the night was over, the sun came up, they take everybody out, they fly them back to the mainland, and put them inside a, a camp, and until the next night, they come out and do it again. That's where the basis of it, so I'd like to elaborate some more. Yes, and so, first off, they found out they were taking Japanese prisoners, and sent because the, the idea was to send a, train a pack of dogs to go out and search out these Japs, right? You heard me there. Mm. Somebody's talking to me. So they were going to go <laughs> take out, find these Japanese soldiers and attack them and maul them to death, right? Well, guess what? They didn't really train the dogs. They mm -hmm. just kind of said, there's somebody out there. Go get them. Well, and with that, so the dogs weren't reacting good at first. So they said, hmm, we'll shock them and whip them. Put shock, in 1944, I bet a shock collar wasn't what it is today. No, I doubt it. And also... <laughs> Probably hooked be, up to the car cheap battery. What, what they would do is before they would actually send the prisoners out to hide, they'd have them hit the dog with sticks and make the dogs mad to make him more vicious. Yes. And then they'd send them out. The people die. And, and for, for the most part, the guys had... People had gear. <laughs> no dogs died. No people died, but... They guys still have scars today where they got attacked in, in the field. Yeah. But and no one knew about this. Right. Secret. But fortunately, a, a gentleman, I'm, I can't remember now, the exact, I should have looked this up. He, I believe he was a Marine sergeant who actually, because half of these dogs quit doing or biting anything because after they beat them soundly a time or two, they were scared to death of humans, right? So they lost half their, their canine team. So. <laughs> And the other half would bite the American soldiers as quick as they mm -hmm. bite the Japanese guys. So, you know, it was not a high, a high success rate uh, operation. And this one uh, sergeant, I'll get his name later, Marine sergeant, was really good at training dogs. He knew about a dog's nose and actually trained one in 30 days to detect gunpowder. And when he showed it to whoever the review board was. They were so impressed with him that they asked him about <laughs> the Star Island deal and why they were having so much trouble. So this guy was put in charge of the training and they started actually training, but they did use heavy defense training. That's why 60% of the dogs that went into the program washed out because it was totally defensive training, totally, you know, torment the dog until he comes out to bite you. But they then, the original deal was when they chose handlers, because they sent them to a school, they were real picky about that. They wanted them to be physically fit. They wanted them to be strong enough to handle the dogs. They thought of everything except one thing. They, they didn't get anybody who knew anything about dogs. Mm. They, they didn't ask, you ever, were you farm raised? Were you city raised? Have you ever owned a dog in your life? They just got all these complete, so they finally, I think it took about a year, year and a half to get things sorted out. Um, and they started getting successful dogs. Now, this goes to uh, some of the great successes, which mostly happen in, in the South, in the Pacific. They had dogs, their dogs were so good. One of the biggest problems they had was as patrols moved through these thick, thick jungles that we're going to talk about in a minute the Japanese would have patrols, snipers sitting 100, 200 yards in front of them. More and than that. More, yeah. And as the soldiers came looking for them, they'd start picking them off. 
Scott said more than that because when they had their trained dogs, especially the Marines with their devil dogs, their Dobermans, which the Japanese came to fear more than they feared the atomic bomb, it seems like, the one dog was recorded and certified, smelled and detected enemy snipers 1,000 yards from the patrol. Mm -hmm. And those were devil dogs, but they were a division of devil dogs called the scout dogs. And they were 90%, they were mostly Dobermans, but they weren't a thousand yards away. So that you could go out and fan out four or five dogs, and they were consistently excellent. Yes. And how many, what's that one dog? How many did he pick out? You, you had, oh, are you talking about Chip? That, no, the scout dog to warn him. How many, how many? There's one dog that actually recorded over 300. Oh, alerts, lines, scout, alerts, scout, alerts, this is yes, a scout dog. Yes, yes. So he actually saved hundreds of lives. Just right. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you go back into, uh, let's go back to the German war, let's go up to Italy, because Italy, uh, when, they, when the troops landed and were trying to go through Italy, they used a bunch of dogs. And they're one of the dogs. We, I did a series on, on war dogs and other heroes, and we're going to continue that. One of the dogs I talked about is Chip. Chip had the coolest story because he was a shepherd and he was a, a scout dog. Mm -hmm. And the, as, they, as, as the squad was moving forward at one point, they got pinned down by machine gun fire. And the uh, Italian soldiers, or I think, no, they were Germans. The German soldiers had taken this shack that the civilians lived in and made it into a machine gun nest. And as the squad was coming up the road, they started <laughs> spraying the area with, with machine gun fire. <laughs> All the soldiers hit the ground and looked for cover. For some reason, Chip, the shepherd, it just really pissed him off. <laughs> he was not happy with being shot at. And he charged this shack that was disguised, this machine gun nest that was disguised, disguised as a shack. His handler's about to have a heart attack, but the fire is so thick he can't get up and do anything. And all of a sudden, the firing stopped. The handler thought his dog was dead. And then he heard a scream and this German soldier comes running out of the machine gun nest shack with Chip firmly attached to his throat. <laughs> and the other five men who comprised the, the machine gun unit were walking out behind him with their hands <laughs> up because they didn't want to tackle poor strip Chip. Now Chip had been cut, he was wounded uh, somewhere in the flat on the inside. But these were the kind of things mm -hmm. that, that some of these dogs were capable of. and. There's more hero stories than, than you can imagine from these dogs. But just the lives that they saved in the Pacific, alerting patrols to enemy fire 200, 300, in one case a thousand yards away, giving the Allies time to call in reconnaissance, air support, to spot these other patrols and then take them out. We, we probably owe a thousand lives to those dogs. Not more. Not more. Yeah. They had the, the quartermaster war dog uh, divisions, so they had over 30 divisions of dogs. That's the army in Europe, and the Marines. I can't even tell you. I didn't really read into it, but they had the devil dogs. Right. You don't want to mess with them. No, you don't want to mess with them. Because if you, if you go ahead and actually look up the, uh, look up the history and actually get into it. There's a lot of accounts and just the, the video, the stories and the, the pictures they see, these dogs are in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. You got guys covering their head and the dogs just sitting there looking around going, oh, what's going on? Yeah. You know? yeah. But the trainers were also picked for their intelligence, the handlers should say, the handlers, their intelligence, their physical abilities, the mental abilities also, mental abilities, to focus right. these dogs and focus on the fire. They took the dog from zero and these dogs are, I mean, Nowadays, you get blank guns to get dogs. You know, people do that, hunting dogs especially. Oh, yeah. You know, but the pressure 
that these dogs felt and what they achieved under these circumstances is amazing. Yeah, think, think about it. You, you got all the bird dog hunters worried about getting their dog, you know, used to the sound of a shotgun or something. Think about getting your dog used to a bazooka. <laughs> and I'm I'm got I'm gonna do a plug here. Let me be clear. Whenever I plug something, it's just because I personally found it. You know, like like our Acme Silent Whistles, I found it to be the best going. This is the most amazing one dog I have ever seen or heard the story of. Now, I said we've got a series on these war dogs, and we'll be adding more. And I'm going to add the link to this story that I did on Judy uh, at the end of this. But what this dog did in a prisoner of war camp over, a, I think, about a four-year period, three or four-year period, maybe more than that, excuse me, was beyond belief. So this dog's name is Judy. The book is called Never a Better Friend. Her name is Judy of Sussex. That's her full name. And I'm going to give you a little brief synopsis on what this, she was an English pointer. Probably they would call her a German short hair pointer, but you know, either country can claim her, I guess. She is the only dog ever recorded as a prisoner of war. And she was listed as a prisoner of war in the Japanese prison camps. She started off the British Navy that was patrolling Indonesia, Sumatra, Malaysia, in this area, uh, Hong Kong. A lot of the ships took a dog on as a mascot, and Judy was taken on to a ship called, I think it was it was a Mosquito or the Gnat, one of the two. They were all called insect class boats. Her boat was torpedoed. She was probably nine or ten months of age. The captain, when he chose her as a mascot, wanted to get a pointer because they would go ashore on some of these islands and go bird hunting sometimes. So he wanted a pointer to help them get, you know, birds, fresh meat. Judy Greatly disappointed. At nine months of age, she wouldn't even look at a bird. Uh, unless it was already cooked, of course. Then she was ready for it. So, you know, they didn't... That was disappointing, but she had a personality, and, and everyone loved her. And she became the mascot. They're patrolling the waters. World War II is starting. Japan is starting to try to invade these other islands, take over all these uh, Singapore and all these places. Judy's patrolling the waters outside of Singapore, and they get torpedoed. The ship goes down. Survivors, there were two or three. There were several ships traveling together. Several are torpedoed. Two or three hundred people, or a hundred some odd people, don't hold me to these numbers because I don't think that good, but uh, all these survivors that could manage to swim, swam to a near island. And they're gathering up there, the captain of the, of the Mosquito is gathering all his troops, all his sailors. They're trying, they had nurses, civilians, because they were starting to evacuate Singapore and these places to avoid the inevitable invasion of the Japanese. The people are sitting on this island, they have nothing. One of the things they didn't have was water. Two days pass, and the captain had, had, had built a raft. Their, their ship, the Mosquito, was still, it hadn't gone all the way down. The nose was still up. It was partially submerged. So he got his man he trusted the most, put him on this big raft. They had, spent two days building and sent him back to the ship. They didn't want to put too many people to go out there and get a whole crew because they were afraid it would sink the rest of the way. Sent him out to this ship to get any medical supplies, water, food, anything he could get and stack on this raft to bring back. All right. So he goes and he's getting walking through which is now a mangled wreck. He's finding what he can find, and as he's fixing to leave, he hears a whimper. He's down below deck in this ship, below the water line, actually. And he follows the whimper, and he gets to one of the one of the dot one of the rooms in the ship that had had a locker, and there, trapped under the locker, is Judy of Sussex. 
He's delighted to see her. People had asked, where's the dog, where's the dog? He gets the locker off of her, brings her, on the, puts her on the raft, takes her back to this island. And that's where her journey began. Now, how intelligent is a dog really? We were gonna talk about intelligence, we didn't get to that. But I'm gonna give you an idea of how little we really understand and regard the intelligence of a dog. Judy had just been saved by this one sailor who pried the locker off of her and rafted her to the island. It only took, she immediately began exploring. She was chasing wild pigs. She was probably having a pretty good time until the second day and she hadn't had a drink of water either. She began casting, they call it, back and forth in this open area of the island and suddenly began digging and digging and digging until suddenly water spouted up from under the ground, fresh water, not sea water, not salt water. She had found water with her nose, which probably saved the lives of, there was at least 100 people on this island. There's no training for that. Mm -mm. And you can say, okay, well, the dog was thirsty and her nose found it. Okay, I'll give you that. Now, I'll tell you what really started impressing me about Judy of Sussex. The Japanese troops came. They surrounded this island. They took all these people prisoner. She ends up in a prisoner of war camp. To save her life, the man who would be her lifetime owner, partner, got the commandant of the camp to list her as a prisoner of war. That way, the guards who hated her and who liked to eat dog couldn't shoot her. So he saved her life there. Now, we're talking about a prison camp where the rations, we know, we've seen the skeletons that came from these places. Frank, her owner, her partner, his rations would consist of a handful of rice in the morning. At lunch, they had a handful of rice of what they called a vegetable soup, which consisted of a brown liquid that if you let it cool too much, went from liquid to like jello. <laughs> so we don't have any vegetables were in it. And then a black tea to wash it down with. He was sharing his food with Judy. A starving animal is going to do what it can to eat. And they were in the middle of a jungle. And Judy could slip in and out of the camp because the guard didn't pay any attention to her. Until a few years later when she started jumping the guards for beating the prisoners, but that's another story. This starving dog was going out into the jungle with crocodiles, which she was attacked by, with Sumatran tigers, which she encountered with every type of poisonous snake and animal you can imagine. She would catch different rodents. She would catch snakes. She would catch rats. Did she stop, sit down, and save herself with a meal? Nope. She brought these critters back to the prison camp at night when she couldn't be seen to Frank and his other prisoners that were in his prison house. This is a dog who's starving to death. She's a German or English pointer. This is a 70 pound dog. When she was finally, her and Frank were finally brought out of the prison camp years later, this dog that should weigh 70 pounds was 27 pounds. And yet, when she found game, she brought it back to her partner and shared the kill. You find me the trainer that can train a dog to do that while it's starving to death, and I'll send him all my dogs for the rest of my life. I agree. So, the book is called No Better Friend. <clears throat> the dog is Judy of Sussex. And at the end of this, I'll put a little 
end screen thingy that'll show you the mm -hmm. the video we did on Judy. War Dogs and other heroes. And uh, you can go take a look, get a little bit more info on her. And if you want to get more curious, if you want to learn some of them, and you'll also, if you look into this book, you'll learn why the men of World War II are called the greatest generation. They'll make you proud. Make you proud, and it's also a different aspect of dogs are characterized or talked about as, you know, they're dogs. Mm -hmm. And some of this is an eye-opener, and it makes you understand dogs better. Yep. There's no limits. Yep. You know, no matter what kind of dog it is. Exactly. No so, matter what you know. kind. And for that reason, I can guarantee you, whatever we do here, it's all about the dogs, people. Count to 20. Come on, Scott. Yep. Let's go get that dog and that shepherd and train him. Get the lights on.